Welcome back, everybody. It is a quarter past seven o'clock. Now, in the news this week, the failed Estina Dairy Farm project has featured quite prominently at the Zondo Commission yesterday with issues raised about threats and suspicious deaths. Also, late last night, ANC Secretary General Ace Mahashule issued a very scathing statement against ANC member Derek Hanukom. It came after the EFF's Julius Malema said Hanukom had actually met with EFF MPs to discuss ways to oust the then President Jacob Zuma. Earlier in the week, there were also questions about the specific conditions required by Treasury before we can bail out the state-owned enterprises. Now, political analyst Kaya Stoll is with us to discuss these issues further. Very good morning to you, Kaya. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. And I guess making uh, headlines, and the big story is, of course, uh, Derek Hanukom uh, at pains trying to fend off allegations that he conspired uh, with the EFF to oust the then former President Jacob Zuma and the fact that he was a spy and uh, the fact that uh, they were conspiring with uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa to form a new party. This particular scenario presents us with a, a variety of schools of thought. On the one hand, Derek Hanukom was well within his rights to make political moves against Zuma or any other uh, political political foe within the party if it is in the best, best interest of the party. And then on the other hand, the ANC should have sanctioned Derek Hanukom uh, for having, you know, uh, been, uh, failed to follow the instructions of the chief whips and, of course, uh, not following a party protocol. So which ones of these school of thoughts do you, uh, do you subscribe to? Well, I suppose it's a question of hypocrisy because, remember, at that point in time, there were people that were explicitly and loudly saying that they were going to vote against the president in their vote of no confidence motion. Yet people like Marcos Cosa who came out and said that we no longer have confidence in this particular president. So you had those types of individuals. And then, of course, we knew that by the time you looked at the votes, there were clearly people from the ANC that voted with the opposition. Now the bigger question is, is the ANC far more comfortable with people not telling it and not people not saying out loud that we actually are going to disrespect the instructions of the caucus, we're going to disrespect the instructions of the chief whips and do things differently, or do they then want to demonize the people that say explicitly that this is what you're going to do? And I suppose that's part of the dilemma here, but I think the key problem that we're seeing with the Derek Hanukkah situation, of course, is that if you want to confide in anyone in this country, it probably shouldn't be Julius Malema on any part of, of the conversation because he's always going to use that whenever it, he needs to and whenever it suits him to then say, oh, by the way, you and I once had this particular conversation do your fellow comrades know about it so that was probably not the best person to confide in but of course if you then look at it from Derek's own perspective which one doesn't necessarily have to agree with he was of the opinion that the country itself would be better off if that particular motion of no confidence were to be carried against the president. So I think for him, he's de decided he's taken what he calls a moral stance. Now, of course, the fact that this is in conflict with the ANC's constitution and the ANC's own rules is really what the, the dilemma is about right now. And I think the ANC has to do some introspection to say, okay, fine, we know that he wasn't the only person who eventually voted in a particular way. So is it really sensible for us to then look at one person and focus on one person and say he's the problem when clearly the disaffection and the anxieties within the party were far more widespread? Now, the Secretary General, Ace Mahashule, released a statement just last night. And uh, I was going through the statement and looking at the tone of that statement, it was quite scathing and uh, quite antagonistic. And some of the issues, you know, they appear to be much more personal than the, than would like to believe. Do you think the statement is representative of the party? Look, I suppose for a person like Derek Hanukom, who's that senior in the party, is a member of the NEC, perhaps the sense of betrayal is much more amplified. This is not just a rank and file branch member from the middle of nowhere. It's a person who's got the ability to influence people within the higher structures because of the position that he holds. So, of course, that sense of betrayal, as far as the NEC is concerned, is much greater than what it would be for any other ordinary person. But I think the way that the statement itself was released is again not a problem of Derek Hanukkah in particular but an ANC problem because now what it says is that there is clearly a sense of frustration and a sense of anger within the ANC and the first thing the ANC should have said is that look this is clearly an internal party matter this is not a matter of state we are going to have a conversation with him and then after that we're going to issue whether you call it a united statement but at least something that says look we've decided as a mature organization to sit down and ask him categorically what the point of that was what the motivation was, and these are the steps that you're taking going forward. Now, that statement clearly indicates that there hasn't been a meeting of the minds, there hasn't been a reconciliation of positions for him to say, this is what motivated me, and for the SG and the party at large to say, look, we still think you are wrong or right. So it really came across as a one-sided, broadside attack, and that's really something that the ANC should have thought beyond, because it really doesn't get them very much far in the conversation. They still need to go back and say, but what do we do going forward? If people that are this senior in the party can still 
still do things like this. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, Ace Mahashule accuses Derek Hanukom of being a wage driver and driving divisions within the party. It's quite interesting because the ANC has long been divided. So it appears that he's being used as a scapegoat. Well, I suppose it was inevitable for a person like that to be accused of such a thing because, let's face it, the ANC itself doesn't know what really the source of the divisions are. A lot of people for a long, for, uh, for a long time assumed it was really the question around the status of Mr. Jacob Zuma. There were people that felt that his position needed to be kept secure until the end of his term and there were people who didn't share that opinion so that was one source of the divides but there's also ideological differences within the party on really what the direction going forward ought to be on really how the state ought to be run so some of these differences are really structural and they're not cannot be attributed to one person what this one person's actions might do is that it might give license might give ammunition sure. and might give breathing space to opposition parties to keep highlighting that this is a party that is divided so i think the best we can accuse him of is to really giving breathing space to opposition parties but to fully then on on uh, allocate all the wedges to him i think it's a bit misplaced sure and uh, yeah and uh, i guess this uh, pr uh, presents a golden opportunity for the anc's integrity commission uh, to prove its metal uh, to to ensure that everybody knows that it doesn't subscribe to the notion of selective application of the law and i suppose then he needs to be hold before the integrity commission so that it proves its metal i mean just like didi mabuza uh, was hold before this uh, the, the the commission after just before uh, his appointment it might just work in the anc's best interest that the integrity commission is not in the head of actually telling us what happens behind the scenes. So even the Didi Mabuza case, it was a matter of he didn't get sworn into parliament, yeah. he had a meeting with the integrity committee and suddenly was sworn into parliament. At no point in time did they then say these are the deliberations, these are the issues that were put to him and this is how we resolved it. So similarly in this one, they can come out and say, look, we're definitely going to have a conversation with Derek Hanacom, but do not then expect that there's going to be a detailed press release that then says, look, we put these charges to him, we questioned him on this and these were his responses and this is the way we've decided to go forward. It's just the way the ANC works. Yeah. And you know, there's been talks of uh, the Ramaphosa ANC, the Zuma ANC, and the other ANC. And of course, there have been allegations that uh, Derek Hancom conspired with uh, President Sir Ramaphosa to form a new party if Nkosazana Lamini Zuma won in the Nazareth conference. Well, if there was such a conspiracy, it was a stillborn conspiracy because perhaps it was a conversation that says, guys, we've taken the view that we want to support this particular slate and we are so aggrieved by what the opposite slate is doing, we cannot imagine imagine working with them beyond the conference. So this is a conversation that will be normal between people that are part of a slate to say, yeah. well, if we've said that we are so completely against what those other guys are doing, how could we then possibly work with them beyond uh, the elective conference? So in this particular instance, whether one should call it a conspiracy, I'm not particularly sure, but rather a discussion amongst people who were concerned or perhaps fearing that they might lose the conference and then thinking, what should we do going forward? That's how COPE was created in the first place, where people mm -hmm. can simply said, look, we cannot reconcile ourselves with these people because the toxic nature of what the engagements were leading up to the elective conference means it would be very difficult for us to work together beyond the conference. So I really don't think we should then start calling it a conspiracy if, of course, the election had gone in a different way and they'd formed a particular political party. That well within their means to do so because, you know, there is no permanent uh, membership in the ANC. If you want to exit, you're free to do so. So it was deliberations, it was conversations that were happening before the conference and people are free to make their own choices. Luckily for them, of course, they were won the elective conference so therefore they didn't have to execute on what we now hear could yeah. have been a plan assuming of course that the person who says there was a plan is correct yeah and whatever it is uh, i mean it's bad pr for the party it's bad pr for cyril ramaphosa who is hell-bent on uh, rebuilding the party and uh, uh, bring the much needed uh, confidence now other news making well other big stories making news headlines in the pic inquiry we've seen uh, the former ceo den majila uh, talking about issues surrounding the segunjalo or the sagamata transaction and the segunjalo group approaching the pic with the aim of uh, you know uh, with a proposal for the pic to invest in independent media and uh, with the intention of uh, uh, a primary listing at the johannesburg stock exchange and a secondary listing in the hong kong and the new york stock exchanges but of course that never materialized now den majila tells us that he was never pressured at all uh, to ink a deal with the uh, with the uh, Iqbal survey yeah I think the most difficult thing about the PIC inquiry is now it's a retrospective exercise and the problem with commissions is that a person sits there on their own and then they bring their own account of what happened there is no immediate feedback so there's no one who's going to stand up and say no 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 actually this is really what you said right, to me right. this is how you pressured me so you really then have to go on this process of trying to reconcile the different accounts so everybody thinks that there was pressure that was being applied on the PIC 
PIC in particular to make things happen. Now the CEO of the PIC says that he felt under no pressure, so he's giving the impression that this was entirely out of his own volition. And every, if that is the case, then the questions that have been raised before then have to come back again to say, but why was this particular transaction, why were these particular steps executed in a manner that was expedited that other people probably don't have access to? And I think those questions still remain large because a lot of people are simply saying that the way that this transaction was executed seem to have been fast-tracked for reasons that people still cannot understand. Mm. And now for the mm. CEO to say there was no pressure mm. at all means that it brings the conversation back internally within the PIC to say, but what exactly was the motivation? What were the steps that were done here? And what were the missteps relating to these particular transactions? And until we have an answer to that, it's still going to remain a cloud hanging over the PIC yep. and particularly Dr. Tan. You know, Kai, we're really thin on time. Please be as uh, brief as you possibly can. Now, we, the, there's uh, also the issue of the Estina Dairy Farm, which is at the, in the spotlight in the State Capture Commission. Now, um, the, the Deputy Chief Justice Raymond Zord was kind of scathing on some of the government officials who did not come up uh, to the commission, saying that, you know, they, they pretend to be supporting the work of the commission, yet they're not withholding crucial information. Surely the commission does have the power of subpoenaing the, the, these people, but uh, it, it's clearly not. Look, the commission did depends largely on a lot of people coming forward and say, look, there was once a transaction where I think there was some malfeasance and some corruption, please could you look into it? So the commission doesn't sit there with the list of 10 or 15 transactions where they know categorically that things happened and are now in a position to summon people. Yeah. A lot of this depends on the volunteer uh, coming through and then saying these are the people that I'm implicating and therefore go going forward. Yeah. So for the, for the DCJ to then expect that people who are in positions of authority within government are then going to suddenly say, let us open up the books for the past 10 years and go and present them it is quite ambitious of him and i think he's going to have to be very categorical to say look i may have read in the media or may have seen in some other platform that this transaction had some whiff of corruption can we look into it but of course it is quite ridiculous to expect people who are sitting in positions of authority to simply then say we're going to stop doing our jobs we're going to do an interrogation and then go and present this to the commission mm -hmm. it just doesn't work like that right kaya thank you so much for your time and i really appreciate your insight and your analysis thank you well, that was uh, political analyst Kaya Sitole just uh, sh sharing with us uh, some of uh, his analysis of the big stories this week. The big story, of course, is uh, Derek Hanekom admitting uh, that he actually conspired with the EFF to oust the then former president Jacob Zuma. And uh, we're still trying to uh, make connection with uh, Derek Hanekom. And uh, yeah, we certainly hope that uh, he will come back to us and uh, we'll chat to him in a moment.